Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message today is The Weaker Person, Stronger Person Principle. And I'll be preaching from Romans chapter 14, if you'll turn there. In Romans, we have this uh, wonderful book that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians at Rome. The Christians came from diverse backgrounds. They were coming together to form the church. Groups of people who had never associated before were now eating together, fellowshipping together, worshiping God together. Some in that group had been raised as believers since they were born, and then others in that group were people who came out of pagan backgrounds and had joined this family of faith. So there was a real diversity in this group of people, this church at Rome. Paul wrote them quite a bit of instructions. It's what we call the book of Romans. And in chapter 14, he talks about something that's so important to uh, not only to the people as it was back then, but it's important to us today. We really need to understand Romans chapter 14. I have several points to my message today. The first is that we should yield to the weaker Christian. Second, yielding to the Lordship of Christ is what really matters. Third, God works with us all differently. And fourth, it's important to have a strong devotion life. So first, yield to the weaker Christian. Romans chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. That passing judgment can also be translated quarreling, without quarreling about disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat anything, everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. The spirit of this chapter is found in verse 1. Do not quarrel over disputable matters. Wow, we could, uh, we could certainly have a series of sermons on that, couldn't we? We could have a marriage enrichment weekend called Don't Quarrel Over Disputable Matters, right? I don't know that anybody would attend it if that was the title of it. We could have an employee meeting at any company. And the topic could be to not quarrel over disputable matters. But that's the spirit behind this chapter. All of us here come from different backgrounds. And our faith journeys vary, yet all of the, our journey's roads intersect with the person of Jesus. In this sanctuary, we have people who have been all over the world. And we have people who have never left the area. We have people who grew up in the city, some who grew up in the country. Some of you were raised in church, some of you were not. Some of you came to faith in Christ when you were young, some as adults. And because of these different, different backgrounds, these varied backgrounds, different experiences we have, we carry different traditions and different beliefs. And I don't really mean different beliefs about Jesus because we're, we're all here. We're, we're here because of one reason, and it's because of Jesus. If it weren't for Jesus, we wouldn't be here today. This diverse crowd would not be here. We would, we would be doing other things. But because of Christ, our roads have intersected right here in this sanctuary. And in these verses, Paul uses food as an illustration. Some people had been raised to believe that eating meat was wrong. They'd been raised in a faith community that taught that. And there are faith groups today 
who believe that and some who believe eating certain kinds of meat is wrong. And during the Old Testament days, God dictated what meat was good and that people could eat and what meat they were forbidden from eating. And in the days that Jesus lived, people, many people, the Jews, were following these rules. In Acts chapter 10, the apostle Peter had a dream. And the scripture says, About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. We've interpreted Peter's dream in this, in, in this scripture, in Acts chapter 10, to mean that the Old Testament rules did not matter anymore. And this was a shocker to the people back then. And we also... We also learn in the book of Acts that people who were forbidden from eating together before were now eating together. The rules were gone because in Christ there was a new way ahead. There was a new day ahead. And what's the everyday application of this? Here it is. Don't purposefully offend people. I believe Paul uses food as the illustration. Paul makes it clear to the people in Rome, do not flaunt your freedom to eat whatever you want, especially if others are not comfortable with it. And he says to the others, not to judge those who eat whatever they want. Let's go back to what I said was the spirit behind this chapter. Do not quarrel over disputable matters. So we should yield to the weaker Christian. Next, yielding to the Lordship of Christ is what really matters. And that's not a quarreling over a, over a disputable matter. This is what really matters, yielding to the Lordship of Christ. Look in verse 5. One man considers one day, now he moves from food to continue to illustrate his point, to days. One man considers one day... Uh, more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and give thanks, gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we eat or live, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, verse 9, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down upon your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give account of himself to God. So yielding to the Lordship of Christ is what really matters. He talks about judging others for their actions. And I have to say that... Uh, you know, in today's world, uh, the, the judge not term is so misused. I mean, if somebody just even says they disagree with something in the news or they disagree with something, quick people are quick to say, what about judge not and all that? Now, there are, there are scriptures that talk about judging. But in this particular scripture, 
Paul instructs the people at Rome, in Rome not to judge each other for the types of food that they eat, not to judge each other for whether uh, if, if one thinks a particular day is sacred and, and someone else finds all days sacred, or whether someone else thinks that all days are just the same. About 30 years ago, I served in a church part-time while going to college. And in that church was a very active family. I think the, the, the oldest in the family, the, the mother and the father, uh, husband and wife had grown up in that church, or at least one of them had, and they had teenagers in the church. They had a daughter that was in my youth group. And they missed several Sundays, and I inquired just to see what was going on. And someone said they'd been going to Dollywood and doing other fun things on Sundays. And you see that the husband and the father of this family had trauma from his service in Vietnam many years prior. And his doctor said that he needed to recreate his mind. And that's what he was doing. Now, I thought it was just awful. I really believe that it was a mistake for him to lead his family like that. I really believe that he was going to lead his family astray. I thought the doctor was wrong because, of course, at age 21 or 22, I knew more than the doctor. Years later, I reconnected with this family, and I learned that the man was doing well. His daughter, who was now an adult, told me that her dad was doing very well. I asked her, How's your dad? And she knew what I was referring to. I was referring to those days when they were at Dollywood and having fun on Sundays. And she got tears in her eyes and she said, Dad is doing just great. You know, had he not followed his doctor's orders, he might have cracked up. Had he not followed his doctor's orders, he might have committed some act of violence. You see, it was not my business to judge him. And since... One thing, th things I've learned in my own military training is that recreation and gaining one's capacity to rest is good therapy when dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. And today that man's doing very well. Don't quarrel over disputable matters. He was doing what his doctor told him to do for his own well-being, and the doctor was right. So, it's important to mind your own business and remember, we never know what others have been through or what they are going through right now. Right? So we should yield to the weaker Christian. We should be yielding to the lordship of Christ and then Paul goes on to inform the people in Rome that God works with us all differently. Look in verse 14. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Underline that verse and circle the word eating. And draw a little line to your margin and put in quotes, anything. Do not, by anything... Destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Verse 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Let's go back to the spirit behind this verse. Do not quarrel 
over disputable matters, but let every effort be made that leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Circle the word food and write anything. He's using food as an illustration. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything that will cause your brother to fall. I ask this question. Why would someone have a freedom in one area of life and another not have that same freedom? And I think it boils down to how Jesus relates to us and how we relate to him. In other passages of scripture, Jesus told one man to sell all that he had and give to the poor. He didn't tell everybody else that. In another passage of scripture, he told one man to follow him and not worry about going back and burying his father. Jesus didn't tell everybody else that. But he relates to all of us differently. Why? Because he is the master physician and he knows exactly what prescription we need. Your doctor. When you go to see your doctor, no telling how many prescriptions he or she writes in one day. What if every doctor said, take two aspirin, go to bed and call me in the morning? You know, if I'm invited to speak at another church, I will ask what translation the pastor uses. I'll ask what, what English translation he uses. I'll ask, how does the pastor normally dress? Why? Because I'm the guest and I don't want to be a stumbling block. You know, if a congregation is, has only heard the King James Version, they might be put off if I use something else. If the pastor wears a coat and tie, they might be put off if I wear something else. You know, if I, if I know of a family that chooses not to eat out on Sunday, I'm not going to ask them to join me in the restaurant on Sunday, and I'm certainly not going to rub it in their faces. I'm not going to say, hey, join us for lunch. Oh, oh, I forgot, you, you all don't eat out on Sunday. See, that violates the spirit behind this chapter. There's a woman that I know who would not shop at grocery stores that sold alcohol. And I think they all do today, pretty much. And she would not eat at Pizza Hut because they sold beer. She had a strong conviction about all that. I respected her for her convictions. She was quiet about them. It would have been wrong for me to ridicule her for her convictions, and it would have been wrong for her to ridicule me for my lack of conv conviction on something that I would consider a disputable matter. Picture it this way. Right down the road is Hickory Plaza. There's a big parking lot there. On one side of the parking lot is CeCe's Pizza. On the other side of the parking lot is Pizza Hut. Let's say that her family and my family both arrive in the parking lot at the same time in different cars and, cars and park by each other. We say hello. Her family goes into CeCe's and my family goes into Pizza Hut. Let's say that we meet again in the parking lot after we eat and we greet again and then we depart. It would have been wrong if we lectured each other. Perhaps the woman who chose to eat at CeCe's might tell her kids, we eat at CeCe's because I don't want to support businesses with alcohol. But when you're older, you're going to have to make up your own mind. That's an important tag to tell your children. If you force that on your kids, they'll go the, they'll go the opposite way. Trust me. I think we have a room full of experience on that matter, right? Here's the application. You'll have to figure out for yourself how this principle of freedom applies in your everyday life. 
If you feel that something is bad for particular reasons, keep in mind that someone else might feel differently or vice versa. And again, let's yield to the weaker Christian, the newer Christian. And when we yield, let's not declare we're doing that. Wouldn't that be arrogant? Again, we would defeat the spirit behind the chapter here. And let's yield to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Bill stops by the office on Sunday mornings, and uh, we had a conversation this past week. And I said, I'm glad you came by because I wanted what we talked about just fits perfectly into the message. We have a meal on Wednesday nights at 530, followed by our Bible study that starts at 630. Uh, I, I, I wanna, I'm a freedom preacher. I hope you're enjoying it. I don't know that you're ever going to hear freedom preaching like I preach. Why? Because I've been in bondage and I don't want to go back. I crossed the Red Sea and I crossed the Jordan River a long time ago. I'm not headed back. Some people probably don't come to the mill because they can't stay for the Bible study and they think it's a package deal. Or, I'm, or maybe they think I'm going to be down on them if they leave after the meal. Hey, I'm going to free everybody up. <laughs> if you can be here at 530 and enjoy fellowship and have a, an inexpensive meal with others, please do that. And if you, if you want to stay great, if you want to leave, it's okay. There's no judgments from me whatsoever. I believe that the fellowship is important. So don't feel that I have to come to the whole thing or what are people going to think or what the preacher is going to You know what I'm going to think? I'm going to think you had something else to do and you had to go. But I was glad you're here for the meal. Nowhere in Tennessee is a preacher going to tell a congregation that today. They'll say, come to the mill and stay for the Bible study. Or, understood, don't come at all. Hey, I want, I want to free everybody up. Let's enjoy this life. We are only on this train one time. You know, I don't want to retire someday and regret putting a whole congregation through bondage when I know that the Bible teaches freedom. I've heard a whole lot of bondage preaching in my life. You know, guilt and shame raises money. You know that? Bondage preaching gets people down the aisle to make false commitments because they feel guilty for that moment, at that moment. I think freedom preaching ought to do just as much. And it, or more, exactly. Thank you, Maybell. Freedom preaching ought to do more. In my giving, I think, since I'm not required by the law to give 10%, as people were in the Old Testament, I'm gaming with myself all the time. How much more can I give? How can I cut this corner so I can give more over here? I think, that, I think about that with my time. I think about that with my preaching. Since I'm not under any particular rules, and since I don't get my sermon emailed to me by a mother church down the road on Wednesdays, expected to preach it on Sunday, since I've got that freedom, what can I do to make the message as applicable and easy to understand as possible? You see the freedom that we have in Christ? Whew. I can't imagine living a life of bondage. I cannot imagine living a life with a theology behind that life of, I've got to please God today in order to be saved. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to, I've got to be careful. If I, if I don't make this left turn, Lord, I've got to turn here. Do I turn left or right? Because I really want to be in your will. And if I make the left turn, maybe I'm going to miss your will read an article to the staff this past week about, a, about an, uh, an Uber driver who had a rosary hanging from his mirror. And he told his rider that he's nev he'd never had an accident in this car with this rosary hanging from his mirror. 
but that a friend of his had removed his rosary from his mirror and had an accident that day. You know what that is? That's just superstition. That's all that is. You know, we could, we could use the Bible as superstition. I mean, if you're carrying around a New Testament in your pocket because you think it gives you power, you may as well be carrying a rabbit's foot. No, really. See, I can't live under that type of bondage. I have to live under freedom. The Word of God is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. But you know what's right here? Paper and ink. It's the meaning. It's the truth behind the Scripture. And where should the Scripture be that gives us power? Right here. And it should influence our lives every day. It should influence how we think. It should influence how we live and how we relate to other people. And then last, Paul closes out this passage of Scripture with really the best possible closing. A strong devotional life is important. Look in verses 22 and 23. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because he is eating, his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Here's my paraphrase of that. Navigating this life is not easy. And the older I get, the more difficult that navigation becomes. Amen? You think you've got it figured out? Wait till you get a little older. You'll find out you don't have it figured out. As a teenager, I did something really dumb. And I asked this older man that was a mentor of mine, how old do you have to be before you quit doing such dumb things? <laughs> he gave me the best answer. He said, when you get old, as you get older, you do less dumb things but they're dumber, the things that you do. Isn't that true? Navigating this life is not easy. We must seek the Lord's will in our lives. Seeking God's will is not an easy thing. Seeking God's will requires us to really pray that the Spirit of God would be released in our lives so that we can understand God's will for our lives. You know what? That takes a lot of work. It's effort for me to get Paul Gunn out of the picture and listen to, to God. And if you'll admit the truth, it takes effort on your part too. Well, good words from Romans chapter 14. It may be difficult, these words, for some of you to understand, so here's my recommendation to you. Read Romans 14 over and over again until it comes to light, until you understand it.